nice and warm in Blackhawk. <laughs> it's six above in Custer this morning, so it's a heat wave. But it was a clear sky, and God left his nightlight on, and it's still up there. Yeah. Well, let's begin with the first hymn. Follow the order of service on page 203. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar 
Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now read responsively the intro for today. Behold, the Lord, the ruler has come and the kingdom and the power and the glory are in his hand. I have come David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My Behold, the Lord, the ruler has come. And the kingdom and the power and the glory are in his hand. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, chapter 42. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench but he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and from the prisons those who sit in darkness. This is the word of our Lord. Please read with me the catechetical review can be found inside your bulletin, the third article of sanctification. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me to the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in one true faith. In his Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all the believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, 
chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Having heard God's word, let us now make confession of our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The uh, text for today is the Old Testament lesson read a few moments ago, the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, the seven verses. Uh, Looking ahead to next Sunday, uh, Lord willing, I'll be back here again, and uh, Pastor Randy will be home. But uh, I agreed to uh, fill in next Sunday as well. And as I was looking there at the epistle lesson for today, the text for next week will be verses right prior to that, although I could include those verses as well in the sermon. But today we look at the Old Testament lesson and um, it has four points to consider. The first point is God's gift to us. The second point is who is this servant in this Old Testament reading? Then there's point three and point four. And uh, the hymn that we sang today, have you ever sung that one before? I haven't. I caught on by verse four. (laughs) Yeah, well, point number one, God's gift to us. Sometimes we want to do our very best for those who are special to us. For example, the little daughter, the little girl who loves her mommy very much wants to prove that love by serving mom in the kitchen. And you can imagine she wants to help with the mixing and the baking and the cleanup She wants to pitch in and show how she really cares. But of course, the kitchen may be more of a disaster when the little girl leaves. However, she leaves with a big smile on her face because she was able to help mom that day. Well, even in our Christian faith, we have a desire to serve someone who is very uh, special to us as we consider all that God has done for us, making us his own dear child in the waters of holy baptism. How many know your baptismal birthday? That's more important than your birthday. And I always told kids in confirmation, I was born, I was baptized on 9-11, which I was, but it was 1948 one month after I was born. And uh, you think about what God has done by adopting us into his family, making us his own dear child in the waters of holy baptism and uniting us with Jesus and hearing the good news of Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, two verses I always read before and at the beginning of every funeral service. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That needs repeating. We too may live a new life which is the theme for today, all because of the life of a servant who stands out from all the others. And this is the servant whom God identifies in this Old Testament text. So point number two, who exactly is this servant? Surely it's not us. We may dare to think that we serve God very well in our lives and we imagine that we always do what God wants us to do. But is that true? Does God always delight in us? If we are truly honest with ourselves, you already know the answer. And the news media is probably not interested in any of our failures as God's servants. Point number three, 
if no one here this morning is the perfect servant of God, who is? And you know that too. We find the answer in the gospel lesson for day in the third chapter of Matthew. Verse 16, after Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up from the water and suddenly the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God coming down as a dove to him. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, my son with whom I am pleased. Do you know why God was pleased with his son? Because everything the son did was just. Jesus came to be the very servant, the perfect servant who would show the world what real justice is through his own life. Number one, he showed that the right way is always God's way. He didn't do what was convenient. He didn't do what was easy He didn't do what brought fame, popularity, and wealth. He did what was right. Jesus said in John 6, I haven't come from heaven to do what I want to do. I've come to do what the one who sent me wants me to do. This is why God was very pleased with his son. Because Jesus didn't live for himself. He had no master but God the Father. His poverty didn't keep him from doing God's will. His taunting, the taunting and ridicule of others, that didn't keep him from doing God's will. Even the tempting of Satan didn't keep him from doing God's will. The threats and the abuse of violent men didn't keep him from doing God's will. The prospect of great suffering and that agonizing death on that cross, even that didn't keep him from doing God's will. God was always pleased with his son. As St. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, Christ never committed any sin. He never spoke deceitfully. Christ never verbally abused those who verbally abused him. When he suffered, he didn't make any threats, but left everything to the one who judges fairly. So, is Jesus a different kind of servant? Yes, he is indeed. Point number four, in Jesus we have been given a new life. Isaiah tells us in verses 6 and 7 that in this servant, we have a light for the Gentile to open eyes that are blind and came to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. What does this mean? That's a good Lutheran question. What does this mean? Well... When you look at that Old Testament text, Isaiah is talking about relief and comfort for those imperfect servants of the world. He is offering hope for people who see no hope, future, or life because they are so burdened down by the sin of their failed servanthood. Isaiah is promising freedom for imperfect servants who are afraid of the price they must pay for sin. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is life. To people who feel blinded or imprisoned by their sin, God's servant, Jesus Christ, brings light and freedom. How does he do it? The answer is in verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And when we are weak and broken because of our sins, Jesus comes to us with love and forgiveness. 
Jesus does not come condemning us, judging us, or making demands on us. Jesus does not come to punish us because we are such poor servants. He comes to us as he came to that woman at the well. You know that story. Her heart was deeply bruised by her sinful life. Her flame of faith was smoldering. And despite her record of sins, we see Jesus is not impatient or harsh with her. Instead, he offers her the water of eternal life, promising those who drink the water I will give them will never become thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give them will become in them a spring that gushes up to eternal life. John 4, verse 14. So, instead of breaking us or snuffing us out for all of our failings as God's servants, Jesus takes all of our failures to the cross so he can be gentle and forgiving with us. Jesus treats each of us like that thief on the cross on Good Friday. That thief on the cross was a miserable servant. He was a complete failure. However, Jesus didn't write him off. When the thief called out to Jesus on that cross on Good Friday, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus did not say, no, you're not worth saving. Instead, he said to him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. So for those who repent and confess Jesus Christ as their personal savior, there is what? Forgiveness. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Isn't that a joyful noise? <laughs> and so good news today from Isaiah that because of God's perfect servant, each day we can live a new life when they think about everything that Jesus has done for you and for me. Why don't we together read the Old Testament lesson? Have it handy there? I should have told you that at the beginning. <clears throat> Why don't we read that together and see if it has more meaning now since the sermon. Together, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Amen. And now let God's peace, which goes beyond anything we can imagine, guard your thoughts and emotions through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. For all the baptized that have been united to Christ's death and resurrection through water and the word, the people of God may be strengthened by the Holy Spirit and equipped with his gifts 
to live the new life given to them by God's gracious act. Let us pray to the Lord. For the church, that in every place where God's people are called and gathered by his spirit, they may be enlightened by his word and sanctified by his grace for holy living and a life of good works to glorify him. Bless Matthew, our synodical president, Scott, our district president, John, our circuit visitor, and Randy, our pastor in Christ, and Trinity Lutheran Church in Belfouche. Let us pray to the Lord. For this community of faith and our unity of confession, witness and mercy work, that the Lord may bless us with faithful pastors to preach God's word and faithful parish leaders to guide us in the fulfillment of all that God has given us to do. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the agencies and institutions of our synod and the mission work we have agreed to do together, that God may bless and prosper the training of church workers, the sending forth of missionaries and the publication of faithful materials for catechism and worship as he humbles our hearts to be accountable one to another. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the nation and those who govern, that our leaders may be people of integrity, that we may be good citizens together, wisely using all the resources God has supplied for purposes consistent with his word and purpose in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For grateful hearts that we may receive the blessing of Christ's body and blood to our benefit and manifest in our daily lives the righteousness of faith, and that God may hasten the day when all earthly divisions will cease and we will be one people in doctrine and fellowship. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for those who have been marked with God's name in baptism but have fallen away from the faith, that we may speak with courage and compassion the saving word of God to them, and that they may be restored to faith and life within this assembly and kept blameless until the return of Christ in glory. Let us pray to the Lord. For the poor, the hungry, and the homeless, that we may remember them in prayer, support them with the resources God has supplied us and encourage them to remain faithful in every adversity of life, let us pray to the Lord. We pray for all noble vocations and worthy callings, that we may use the talents and skills supplied to us by the Lord in ways that honor him, serve our neighbor, and glorify his holy name. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer depression and illness of mind, that they may be comforted in their anxiety, given peace and comfort in their fears, and be renewed in hope through the good news of Christ crucified and risen. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the sick that God would grant healing for their bodies according to his will and strength to bear the infirmities they suffer. We pray for Dave, Mary, Esther, Jackie, Norma Jean, Ron, Mike, Clara, Connie, Faith, Kelly and family, Bonnie, Zoe, Alvin and Doris, Kelly, and all with concerns. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for those who mourn, that God would grant them comfort in their time of sorrow and encourage them with the hope 
of everlasting life with those whom they loved who have departed this life in faith. We pray for Dave, Doug, and Cora, and Loretta. Let us pray to the Lord. O merciful Lord, grant that we may have confidence in the promise given to us in our baptism into Christ and trust you to provide answer to the prayers we bring to you this day. And when the last day comes, bring each of us into the joy of your everlasting light and life through the merits and mercies of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now receive our offering. Let us continue on page 208. Let us rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemn the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promise salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that comes to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, for the forgiveness of sins. This do in remembrance of me. In the, same walls, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated.
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn. When I went to Concordia College in St. Paul, you have to take pretests. One was for religion, so they knew what classes you needed to take. One was a music test. Had I known what I had to do after that test, I would have flunked it on purpose. Because <laughs> I got 100%. But uh, I had to take two quarters of piano lessons. <laughs> And, uh, and then I had to take Music Theory 1. So I had my accordion with me at college. And so when the assignments were given to us, I took out my accordion, and in 15 minutes, I had it done. Did I learn anything? No. <laughs> the professor wanted me to take Music Theory 2. I thought, I'm not dumb, you know. <laughs> no thanks. And of course, music theory is to know, I think, how to substitute or how to, how, to, how to transpose. Well, if you have an organ, sometimes they have a transposer button on there. So if you have a B-flat trumpet playing, you have to make sure the organist knows how to play it in the key of B-flat. Well, you don't have time to transpose. So you have this button that you turn it to B-flat, and you just play in the key of C, but the organ will sound like, sound like B-flat. Some of the organs will have that full, all the pedals. Some of us can't play the pedals, because we're used to the buttons on the accordion. But uh, 
they have another button on the organ that you can turn and that takes the pedals and puts it on the lower register of the organ. So it's just like a big computer sitting over there. But it really takes a lot of talent to play all those notes and then sing too. Yeah, some can do that, but anyway. So when I uh, took first grade, I took piano lessons, and then my parents moved to a smaller home, sold the piano, and so there went my lessons. Yahoo! Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so about the third grade, you know, I'd be out playing somewhere in the house, and I would hear Lawrence Welk. My parents would watch Lawrence Welk. And Myron and Florin would be playing. Boy, I was right in front of the TV. When that was over with, I was gone. And uh, my mom, she says, you want to learn how to play one of those? Sure. I already know how to play this side, the keys. And uh, so you start out with an accordion that has only 12 buttons on the left side. And then in the music, the sheet music, it has above each measure has an arrow like this, that means I gotta pull it this way. If the arrow is like that, I gotta push it back in eventually. You learn how to do that. And then after about a year, they switch you to a 48 base, 48 buttons on this side. And once you learn that, then they switch you to 72 base. Well, when I was done with the 48 base, they switched me right away to the 120. And uh, so, that's my story. <laughs> I didn't bring it with me, by the way, so there's, there's no waltz or polka. Any announcements? Right here. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Anderson, for being here today. I appreciate your joining us. A couple of announcements. Uh, today, this young lady right here will give you a flu shot if you want one. She won't make you have it, but she will give it to you if you pay for it, right? $15 for a regular flu shot and $55 for the high dose, the turbocharged one. So if you need that, you can meet her out in the uh, copier room right behind Melissa's office, and she will give you a flu shot. Next Sunday, uh, Maria Kitchens, who is a member at the church here, is going to provide a buffet-style lunch for anybody that wants to come. In fact, I was told that she made 1,100 egg rolls. So I think the whole town can show up if they want to. But that is going to be provided right after second service. She does this because uh, she is Filipino, and it is in their culture to commemorate the passing of a loved one, and this is how they do that with a meal once per year. And then on January 26th, two weeks from today, we have our quarterly voters meeting, and this is an important one because this is where we approve the budget. We go over plans for 2020, and we elect officers for the new year. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Yes. Pastor Sersenbecker said, you can go with me to Hong Kong this time. I said, how about I just do pulpit supply? <laughs> I've been to Hong Kong twice, and I tried some of the food. <laughs>